And, uh, you know, the more I see it, the more I feel it. Like, you feel this movie. You feel the intimacy. You feel the, uh, the, the loneliness, too. You feel the heartbreak. Uh, and this is your third film as a third feature as a director, uh, going back to 2001's Chelsea Walls. What were you looking for this time? What a good question. Um, <laughs> I was looking to grow up. You know, I've, I've been doing this a while now, and I really wanted the experience that I had read about as a young person. I mean, so I was really coming of age making movies in the 90s. You know, that was where I first worked with Richard Linklater. That's where I was, you know, that, that was my, whatever you call it, coming out part. Mm -hmm. But as a student, it was the 70s that I'd grown up on. And I'd grown up on reading about Dennis Hopper and all these lunatics, Cassavetes, making movies. And this idea of movies where it wasn't a unit of sale, where it was an adventure, an expression, a meeting place in the dark, you know? And, and I really wanted that experience before I died of making a movie that felt like a rebellious act. You know, we went down, this whole movie was an adventure. And I, I wanted it, I wanted to make a movie about creativity, and I wanted to use everything that I learned. I've had a lot of amazing experiences. Uh, I've worked with people that have blown me away, and I, I, you know, you get to a place where you wanna just take what you learned and use it. And that's kind of where I came at this. Does that make sense? Absolutely, yeah. Yeah, sure. <laughs> you know, somebody can get there. <laughs> Sing it, sister! <laughs> well, you know, this is a film that that is, has been resonating since the premiere in Sundance back in January. And now since it's opened, you know, the, the uh, Rock Tomatoes thing, I'm sure you all know what that is, you know, the score is 100%. <laughs> This, this, you know, going back to the '90s, growing up, uh, you're coming in, coming out party in the '90s as an actor, and your your emergence as a director in 2001, and to to bring all of that experience as an actor, as a director, as a writer, and as a producer, uh, put your heart and soul into something, do it really, really low budget, as the case would say. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> I um. There's something that's beautiful. One thing that's amazing about working in the theater is that nobody gets paid, right? And one of the things that's amazing about that is you know exactly why everyone's in the room. And it, it's this level playing field. And I know that we all want to pay for our kids and we all want good health insurance. I, I, I get all that. But there is something beautiful when you eradicate the idea that anyone is accumulating wealth. Because we had so many funny experiences that, that brought this movie around. For example, um, you know, we couldn't afford to rent an 18-wheeler. I'd always, you know, all of everything you hear about boys, boys is hitchhiking. Yeah. Well, so what do you do? You can't afford one. You can't afford a driver. You can't afford the insurance. What do you do? You go to the gas station and say, yo, you heard boys, boys. <laughs> and, and eventually somebody goes, I love that guy. <laughs> and, well, we're making a movie about him. No shit. Yeah. You lend us your 18 wheeler? <laughs> How long? A couple hours? You know? And I, I tell that story meaning the painters in the movie, so much of the crew, the cast, I mean, Ali Shawkat, oh, for example, great. you know, amazing actress. I, I didn't know who Alia was. My wife is our producer, and I was tr trying to write the script, trying to write the script, and I was working with Sybil Rosen, who wrote the memoir, Living in the Woods in the Tree, and my wife came to me one day, she said, I found her. I'm like, who, who? Alia Shawkat, I said, I have no idea who that is. Here, and she made like, you know, the world we live in, she made all these links. <laughs> Right, a link to this episode of that show, and a link to that episode, and a link to her interview on Jimmy Fallon, and a link to this, and I'm, I'm watching, I'm like, yeah, man, wow, she's amazing. 
she's great, you know? And so I try to get a meeting with her. It turns out she's very important. She can't be in LA. And I'm, I'm, you know, it's a long story, but I, I got myself deep in, this project happened fast. And I kind of got a green light before I was done with the script. So I agreed to Skype with her, and I gave her this pitch. I said, listen, I'm making this movie. It's going to star somebody you've never heard of. It's about somebody you've never heard of. I'm writing the script. I'm, I'm halfway through it. It starts in about six weeks, and you're perfect for it. And she's like, yeah, okay. Okay, what is it? And I said, well, it's the story of Blaze Foley. She's like, oh, Clay Pigeon's my favorite song. Oh. And I was like, I was like, oh. right. you know, you know the thing about Skype. My wife was behind the computer, and I'm like, <laughs> you know, and, and, uh, and it, people were drawn. That there was this like-mindedness to everybody involved because of Blaze, because of the music. Right. There's a certain kind of most people have never heard of him. The idea that Ali had absolutely shocked me. Um, and part of the joy of making the movie from the crew on up was pushing the music forward, of saying, hey, we're not making a biopic about somebody you've already heard of, somebody who's already been championed. We're making a movie, and we're championing the work while we're doing it. So you're a part of it. I mean, another funny story, you know the, there's a lot of jokes about harmonica players in the movie, right? <laughs> well, all, all of that, I'll try to explain this. It gently, which was that I wanted all the music to be live. I wanted to cast musicians. You know, Ben Dickey, who played Blaze, never acted before, right? Ben Dickey, ladies I mean, come on. Wow. I mean, give me a break, right? Charlie Sexton's acted a few times. He's one of the world's great musicians of my generation. I mean, he's an amazing person playing Towns Van Zandt. This is the idea. All the music's going to be authentic. We do it all live. But I also. In my mind, I was like, all right, I need somebody on screen who knows how to act to help these guys, right? You know, and, and I started a theater company when I was 21 with this guy, Josh Hamilton, and you might have seen him in eighth grade this year. He's one of my best friends, you know, and, and I asked Josh, I said, listen, man, I need, I need to run a little acting workshop. And Josh has taught me so much about acting. I mean, I can tell you, we did Hurley Burley, and he had this book, like, How to Stop Acting on the Table, you know? And we would talk... He's a very important person to me. I'm like, listen, I need your help. He comes down, and, and he does it. Where am I going? I lost my total train of thought. What were we talking about? Uh, <laughs> what? Uh, Harmonica! Thank you! Okay, here's the problem. Live music. Josh doesn't play any music, right? So I'm like, I gotta do it. You'll be the harmonica. No problem. Because, I mean, who can't fake playing the harmonica? I mean, and, and uh, he's like, cool, cool. The trouble is, then I realized that I needed our harmonica player, because he couldn't play it. And I was doing this live, I'm recording it live, so I can't do it in post. My whole idea was to not do these pre-records. Mm -hmm. So I needed a harmonica player on set behind the camera while Josh was faking it. <laughs> well, it turns out, musicians had a lot of animosity towards harmonica players. <laughs> I had no idea, right? No figure. So, yeah, who knew? But. I, I found, I couldn't get a harmonica player. I couldn't get a harmonica player. Nobody wants to be back, you know, hiding in a box playing harmonica. You know, and, and Charlie tells me, hey, you know, one time in New Orleans, I met this guy, he's like a genius harmonica player. And, you know, tell him that we're friends and tell him, you know, that we want to do this. So I call the guy up and I say, hey, listen, we're doing a movie about Blaze Foley and I need a harmonica player. I'm in. I love it. This is an amazing project. Blaze Foley, are you kidding me? I played with him once. Like, you know, wow. like that's, that's amazing. The only time I can't do it is December 7th through the 19th. And I'm like, okay, I, I need you the 7th through the 19th. <laughs> and he's like, I mean, I'm available anytime. And that's the way it rolled. You know, he just, he had a, he, for two years, he'd saved money for a fishing trip to Peru. Oh. And he oh. dropped it like that in one call. And it's not me. It was Blaze, you know? And so when he came, there was this whole energy of a common goal, which is pushing. We all know, we all have friends. We're it ourselves. We know what it's like to be friends with a dancer who can't make her living dancing. You make a painter who can't sell a painting, a musician who's brilliant, who can't find their way, a filmmaker. I mean, the world is full of Blaze Foley's. 
and we're inundated with biopics about people who are like have trouble arranging their Grammys on the show. You know? <laughs> and, 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 and so it was something that was bringing everybody together. And, uh, and that's what got us. You know, you know it's interesting. Uh, when you saw the, you know, a lot of people who will say, I mean, before, I saw, before I saw the movie in January, I did not know who Lloyd Soli was. In fact, when I was watching the film, I thought it was fiction. And it, the way it's structured, the way it jumps back and forth, the not linear, and again, just, it just feels so, so genuine, it didn't feel episodic, like a yeah, lot right. of these biopics are. Uh, but you know, so, so a lot, most people don't know who Blaze Foley is, but then a lot of people go, oh my God, I love Blaze Foley. And it's, it's the same sort of thing with someone like Graham Parsons. Yeah. Mm -hmm. What is it about these musicians that they never got the huge amount of fame that they deserve, but everyone else picked up on them? Yeah, but you fight. know, the truth is, there's people that can speak more intelligently about it than me, but it's really built on the back of the blues. You know, that, you know, black people have been singing this music for a long, it's built on a national wound, you know, and they've been singing this song, and the beautiful thing about the blues is it's taking a deep, not a fake sadness, not like, oh, boo, who sadness, like criminal sadness, like crimes have been done to me. Yeah, yeah. And, and, I'm in a tremendous amount of pain, and I'm gonna make a joke, and I'm gonna invite you in, and together we can heal. That's what Lightning Hopkins does. That's what Mississippi John Hurt does. That's what Blind Willie McTell does. That's the root of all good country music. You know, it's built on this real ethos of a spiritual awakening from the land, you know? And so all those guys were hurt. Graham Parsons knew it, Blaze Foley knew it, Towns Van Zandt knew it, Elvis Presley knew it, Eminem knew it, D you know what I mean? It's a long history of building in the back of the sonic embodiment of this country. Uh, and so it's, it's powerful music. So, you know, Ben Dickey, you know, you're watching the film, you, you know, you're getting, like, you're getting absorbed by his, his performance. And then he has that scene where he's sitting uh, I guess on the step and it's in tears. And then he has that great death scene. And it's his first movie. Uh, I mean, like, how far into working with him did you realize that this guy was like the real deal as an actor? I, you know, I'm not, it's just, it's an incredible thing. It yeah, really, it really was. I can't tell you guys. I have been acting since I was 13, and I take a lot of it for granted. Like, I didn't know. I, he was my friend. When I first asked him to play this part, right, he thought I was kidding. <laughs> I mean, he really did. I, his band broken up. He was really sad. He was sitting there on the couch. I was drunk as shit. You like, should play Blaze Foley in a movie. <laughs> and the drunker I got, the more I thought that that was an amazing idea. He's amazing. And 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 so I said, Hey, man, I'm going to do this. And he's like, Yeah, cool, man. You know, I mean, you got to know Ben. I mean, Ben lives on a farm in Louisiana. I mean, Ben is he's the embodiment of laid back. And I asked him to learn. He learned. I mean, he went Daniel Day Lewis deep. He learned all of Blaze Foley's music. I mean, he sat alone in a room playing it all. Uh, he wrote Sybil Rosen, uh, basically like these little emails that were about a, the length of a postcard. Uh, twice a day, and she would write back, and he would say, I learned um, World War III, one of uh, Blaze's songs today. What do you know about that? Well, World War III, he wrote that when we drove from Cincinnati to such a... Did he, did he, did he finger pick it or did he pluck it, you know? Well, like, you know, I mean, he, he's going, he really got obsessed with it in a beautiful way that gave him, he would speak to you if he was here about the shame that he felt standing in the shoes of someone, of a real human being. He was a human being. Yeah, yeah. You know, and, and saying, I'm not you. And I was saying to him, look, it's storytelling, it's a value. I, I'm not Hamlet either, right? But it's a value, we're telling stories, we're communicating. And he really kind of got that idea, and he gave himself over to it. And he was fucking nervous, wow. okay? As he says, I was nervous in the service, bro. <laughs> uh, and, um, and then what happened is, slowly, like a song, you know, he, you know, you ever watch a musician, 
uh, be really nervous when they start playing a song and then they slowly lose themselves. He just lost himself. And it happened over a period of six to eight weeks. Uh, I remember, you know, the scene we talked about, there's an amazing, in the Austin Chronicle report of Blaze's death that I found, right? It says, last scene, walking over Congress Avenue, talking to a chrysanthemum. <laughs> and I read that and I thought, what the hell was he saying? <laughs> and I started with a thing about that, and I read Sybil's memoir, and one of the things that really haunted her is they had planted a jasmine plant when they moved out of the treehouse. They, they, they planted it, and when he died, she went back and she couldn't find it. The treehouse was destroyed for some insurance policy, and she couldn't find the jasmine plant. And a part of me thought, well, and she started just kind of talking to the woods. Where'd you go? Where'd you go? And I had this kind of imagination of like, well, they're kind of talking to each other through this plan. And I wrote this speech for Ben, and it was towards the end. And I remember it just took off. You know, I remember like the, we did a take of it, and I, I turned to the DP, and the DP was crying. And, and I said, well, let's go again. And then all of a sudden, like, some sirens came. You gotta understand, doing a period movie these days with no money is really hard, right? You know, if you, you, to try to get a Prius not to drive by. And shoot, you know? I mean, it's one thing to act it well. It's another thing to not have somebody go, yo, you, you went to training day. You know? Yes, I was. Um, and, uh, and, and the DP says, that whole monologue, that plants in one take. He's just sitting there. He worked on it all day long and it came out of him like a flood. Wow, amazing. I want to take questions from the audience, but I do want to ask uh, uh, a quick question about, about Ben working with uh, Charlie. Charlie Sexton. I mean, like, what's, that, in, what's that connection like, you know? You guys, for those who don't know, Charlie Sexton, you know, plays Towns Van Zandt, is yeah, just... He's amazing, you know, yeah. and, and Ben, you to, Ben's a little younger than me, right? So Ben grew up worship. If you were like a guitar geek, you were a Charlie Sexton geek, right? Ben would talk about reading like Guitar Magazine. And, you know, it, Charlie Sexton played with Jerry Lee Lewis when he was 13, okay? So, I mean, Charlie knew Towns Van Zandt. Charlie knew Blaze Foley. Charlie had to try to climb over Blaze when he was a little boy, like on his way to school. Because um, Blaze was passed out in his uh, doorway, right? You know, um, and so Charlie had a lot to bring to this. And Charlie, I think, a little bit like uh, Gandalf or something like that, you know, <laughs> breathed confidence into Ben oh, cool. that he was qualified to do this. Um, yeah. All right, question here. Hang on, since you're in the front row, you get the mic. <laughs> Uh, first off, it was a beautiful movie uh, from beginning to end. Uh, my question would be regarding the source material and Sybil Rosen. Um, what was your relationship with her like? Because I've, I've read that book and it's amazing. It's an amazing book. When I came across it, I, uh, I really expected something less. I just have read a lot of books about rock gods and the <laughs> deification of the individual. And, Instead, this book is about her. Yeah. It's about a young woman and an older woman, a young woman in love with a real man, an older woman in love with a ghost. And it's a very, very powerful book. And it, it, it got at a relationship to time that really interested me in this book. And when I first talked to her about it, I was said like, oh, we, you know, this movie aspires to have a past, present, future kind of great happening oh, at works. the same time, yeah. you know? And she got that. And she also is enough of an artist to understand that we didn't want to do some Wikipedia. Like, I would challenge everybody. The movie needed to work as a fiction. Yeah, Meaning, like, yeah. I, I, it should work. If I saw Raging Bull, I had no idea if Jake LaMotta was real. Right? It's just a great film. It's using boxing as a metaphor to teach us about our lives. Right? Yeah. And if, if the movie's interesting only because it's real, then it's not a good movie, really. Because the real thing exists. Without, with or without our acknowledgement. Our job was to make art, and she got that. Mm -hmm. And so she was vital to giving Ben permission to go for it, giving Charlie permission to go for it. Um, she was our 
you know, our touch tone, our spirit animal, our guide. Uh, it's in very many ways, it's her film. Yeah. Again, great Next music. Question. All right, this is Jeremy Front Row. Why not? All these guys get to play. You know. <laughs> does Ben have the bug now? Does he want to continue acting? You know, he would say, I've, he's been, I've been with him when he's been asked that question, and his answer usually is that the biggest surprise to him about acting was how much he would love it and how much it's like playing music with rests and rhythms and pace and energy. And, you know, you can play, uh, you know, you can play Hey Jude like a dirge. You can play it loud, you can play it melancholy, you can play, it's, he, he loves that. And, and he loves understanding mise-en-scene, you know, tone, mood, energy, the movement of energy. And, um, and he also really liked Alien. Yeah. So, you know. <laughs> <laughs> one, uh, I've got time for one more question. If, uh, uh, there's one right there, yes. Yeah. yeah, thanks for asking. He's asking about the Chris Christopherson scene. So imagine you're me, right? And you're like, okay, I want to speak to where, where Blaze's pain comes from. You, you know, I want to do it without being like some armchair psychologist, right? I got I to gotta have a legend's dad. Who's going to play a, a legend of outlaw country's dad? Right? It's only one person. It's only like Chris Christopherson. And weirdly... So I really wanted it as a tip of the hat to Ben to say you're not alone. Meaning Chris is one of the great actor musicians of all time. In fact, Chris is so interesting that he's you don't people don't really differentiate between Chris the musician and Chris the actor. He's just Chris Christopherson. Yeah, yeah. And the same energy that wrote me and Bobby McGee is the same energy in Pat Garrett and Billy the Kid, or you know, he, he transcended stay in your lane. It, it just, he just, in that 70s, you know, when we first started this conversation, that spirit of the 70s, you know, it was Chris. And so I wrote him a big, long, fat letter, mm -hmm. and he agreed to do it. And very mysteriously, I really didn't know why. I was quite surprised because we had no money, and he had to fly from Hawaii to Baton Rouge to do it. And I want to respect him enough not to be, I don't want to be cagey, but you know, he's still an artist. He had something he wanted to do. There was something about this character and saying goodbye to his children that was vital to him as part of his life as an actor. And he wanted to do it on screen. And he came to do it. And it was very, very moving. And uh, Marsha, Blaze's sister, it's an incredible day. You know, when Marsha, Marsha was a friend to this project and gave us the rights to Blaze's music, it was incredible, you, you know. And she heard Chris is gonna be there, and so she drove into the set, and she brought, in that scene, when Ben is playing for Chris, Ben is playing Blaze's guitar, wow. the famous guitar, right? That, uh, because she has it, and she brought it, and she said, you know, it means so much to, to my brother if you would sign his guitar. So we all got to watch Chris sign Blaze's guitar. Uh -huh. I know it was 30 years too late, but it didn't feel too late, you know? <laughs> it felt like significant. And that's, Chris is there, it's really beautiful. Are we done? We're done. Hey, thank you guys. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.